two ladies exploring the personal stories and experiences of women in ufology and the paranormal. Women of the Dark, our new podcast show in conjunction with Pursuit of the Paranormal and UFO Identified. We are back for show number two. So welcome, Abs. And we have Christina Gomez with us today, who is our new guest for this evening's show. So if you would like to just give the listeners a little bit of a bio about you and a little bit of an introduction before we, we start picking your brains. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me on. I I do appreciate it. And I know that there's just not a lot of females in the UFO field. So to be able to collaborate with you, I think is absolutely fantastic. Now, as for my background, I've always been interested in UFOs and the paranormal, but it didn't really start until I entered university, which I'm still in university now. And I really got interested in it with the TV show, The Twilight Zone. Have you guys seen that show? Oh, yeah, it's the so good for us growing up. Was the yeah, show. exactly. Yeah, for, for myself as well. And so my dad got me into all of that. And even though it's way past my time as I was born in 1999, um, I, I, I just can't get enough of it. It's so good. So the reason to why I have four shows a week, have it be shifting the paradigm, mysteries with a history or the unknown zone or weekly strange news. It's really to get my generation involved in the subject, to get interested, to be curious, because so many of us are still in that entertainment malaise where we care about what certain celebrities are doing, but it doesn't really give us any value into our lives. But with this subject, have it be UFOs, have it be the paranormal, have it be anything just mysterious, it makes you think first off outside of the box. But secondly, it makes your, you know, the things that you're going through look so small because you're looking at the bigger picture of everything that's going on and all things that you don't understand, you can attempt and jump into that little box of imagination to go for it versus just buying the newest product, you know, talk, listening to what your favorite celebrity has to say, which there's nothing wrong with that, but there's so much more to life than just that. Mm-hmm. There's so much more that we don't understand, which is getting the brain cells fired. What That's are you right. studying at university? I'm studying business and communication. Nice. How do you fit that in along with the shift in the paradigm and the strangeness and all the other? Well, I can tell you in my years of being in university, I've learned almost nothing. Uh, That's how disappointing (laughs) it is. I'm really just going because I come from a Latin background. My, both of my parents are from Latin America and education is the most important thing to them. So as long as I have a degree, no matter what that, what that degree is in, I'm good to go. So, um, while I do think college is important in some aspects, In the classes that I've taken, I think my favorite class that I actually learned something was body language, how to read body language class. And it has nothing to do with my degree at all, but I found it very useful. Now, also with the business aspect, you know, when you're contacting um, people to be on your shows or to get like reference points and things like this, I think it's also very important to know how to um, write emails and to write resumes, press kits, and it's what we learned in, um, in one of my classes. So I found that useful where I'm kind of networking with other people. But aside from that, um, I haven't used it too much. Not yet, at least. There's, there's time for that. There's time. I, I sure yeah, do I, hope so. I'm paying a lot of money for it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't use mine either. It just left me with more questions than answers. So I don't use mine at all, really, apart from my organisational skills that I learned there. Um, But again, your age, do you find it difficult being so young, breaking into this sort of industry and getting some of the higher profile people to, to talk to you, one being female, one being young, and another sometimes race? 
it's when we first started, it was really difficult to be taken seriously. And it, I was so disappointed on how I was being treated into the in the community. Because yes, I'm very young. Yes, I'm female, which those things are too already rare. And then also being Latin American, there's such a few percentage of us in the field. And so I had to work extra hard to be taken seriously to make show make sure that my shows were so poshed so clean that if anyone were to look at them they'd be like oh it's been doing it for quite some time even though I practically jumped in blind but as the year has progressed I have been able to speak to a few people that are I guess you could say high in the food chain. I don't want really want to say it like that, but um, high profile in the business. Is the there yeah, you go. And and they've been nothing but kind to me, nothing but supportive. And I've been so grateful to speak to the people that I have spoken to. I've done almost 200 shows on my channel in about a year and a half, two years. And with that, I've been able to gain a lot of experience because podcasting showing yourself on camera, speaking to others, it's not easy at no. all. No, no, no matter how social you are in the real world, or if you're not doing it on camera is a whole different ball game. And it was a lot of trial and error for me to kind of get it right to see what I liked, what I didn't like, how I wanted to fix it to make sure that everything looked good. Because while in person talking with your hands is like looks so great on camera it looks terrible it looks so bad so I had to learn how to like sit on my hands and be like okay I'm not gonna talk because you know I have Latin blood so I'm always like with my uh -huh. hands all the time but when looking at and speaking to other people in the field it was hard at first it, it's gotten a lot easier but I'm still not always taken seriously and it's it's disappointing mm. we, we get dismissed quite a bit which can be quite yeah well it's offensive for one thing it's it's um upsetting but at the same time I think that with the like the more shows that you do and people kind of see your in a sense your resume or your background it's going to be a lot easier and then that's how it was for me it was very difficult mm -hmm. at first but now with the more people that I've spoken to the more networking that's been done um it's gotten easier but of course there's still those that are like who are you no you're actually too young I have I want nothing to do with you and I'm like you just well, wait buddy you just wait a few more years and you're going to be asking me to talk no, to me you're more influential than you think because you sent me down uh, more than one rabbit hole because when we have that we were going to be talking to you I'm like right you should <laughs> I, and I'm like no you're gonna have to wait I'm in the middle of something no you're gonna have to wait in the middle of something and then it was Ooh, what's that program? And then I've spent binge watching um, <laughs> Ghosts of Devil's Perch and yeah. it's just rabbit holes, rabbit holes, rabbit holes. And so you are influencing what people are watching and looking at. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the Ghosts of Devil's Perch, which is an interesting TV show. I, um, Dave Schrader is an amazing person. He's a great paranormal investigator. But aside from that, he's just so good at making his story is very relatable, very personable, where like when you listen to him, you sound, it, it feels like you're there with him experiencing those things. And so being able to speak with him, it was such a blast. And um, I, that's something that I really enjoy about doing interviews is that like, first, you kind of see them as someone that's either, you know, one famous or two, that's just um, someone that you want to speak to and then once you do that interview you 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 get that kind of relationship and it was such a pleasure to speak with him and to speak about ghosts of devil's perch it was a lot of fun yes do, I would really like to do you have a preference between sort of ufology or paranormal or do you see it very much like i do and abs does is this like two separate entities that blend together and really are like you can't really have one without the other what's what's your sort of view on that when I first started getting into all of this I was purely nuts and bolts in the UFO field I wanted the data I wanted the facts I wanted something that was tangible now as my research has progressed I've come to realize just like yourselves where it kind of 
con- there's a convergence between the UFO phenomenon and the paranormal yeah. and everything that's somewhat mysterious. That could also be with cryptids where there have been many reports of Bigfoot sightings and then a UFO sighting at the mm-hmm. same time. And so if you were to tell me that two years ago, I'd be like, nah, you're out of your mind. There's no way. But the more people that I've spoken to, the more research that I've done, the more books that I've read, they're they're not they're not two separate entities they're Mm -hmm. they're they work together they they're either one of the same or it could be very well that it's the exact same thing but we're labeling it different depending on the the eyes the lenses that we're using the perspective that we have on these things and also your background your experience your religious beliefs as well these are all very important factors that we need to consider when for instance, when we're interviewing a witness to know a little bit about themselves, to know a little bit about them so that we know how to ask the proper questions so that they don't bring their bias with them, which every single one of us have due to our previous experiences, due to the environment that we grew up in. And so I think that sometimes these labels can be really confusing when in reality, they're two of the same thing. Talking of labels, we quite often um, hear the label and latterly really kind of embrace and laugh at the label that uh, we're all tin hat foil, uh, foil hat wearing, you know, loonies in this field. You know, we're mental, we're unstable, we're weird, we're odd. What do you do and how do you manage some of those really negative labels when you hear them, when people talk about the things that we're interested in and can't get their heads around what we believe? The biggest thing that you can pass to anyone is the the Pentagon report, the ODNI report, the, the preliminary report that was released in June of 2021. The United States government and governments across the globe are interested in this topic. We're no longer classified as necessarily crazy and that's in quotation marks because some of us still are and that's totally fine but I think that that is something that people can get a grip of versus anecdotal stories they were like oh I saw this all right you saw something great that's awesome but when you bring in the government into the conversation where there have been reports there have been UFO projects such as ATIP, where they are looking into this and it is a real phenomenon. People take a step back and they're like, tell me more. That's really interesting because now they can grasp onto something. And for many people, the reason to why they got interested in the UFO topic was that 2017 New York Times article where ATIP really came out into the public, that that name was just dropped into the world. And everyone was like, now that there's information on UFOs, real tangible evidence, I'm in. I, I want to get involved. I, I want to know the. I want to know the background, the history. I want to see the research. But before that time period, 2017, this conversation was a, a different thing altogether. So I think that now more than ever, we're not necessarily being classified as those with a tinfoil hat or as crazy because more and more people are getting interested. Mm. We we embrace the tinfoil hat wearing here. We yeah, we, are, we really do. We had a we do, we do. <laughs> um, Over in um, with us over in the UK, certainly um, most of the people um, in in my family and close friends are, are non-believers of of anything paranormal and certainly anything UFO wise. When you talk to them, the response is pretty much all the time of oh that ufo stuff's all a load of rubbish that's all the americans they don't think of ufology or any of that phenomenon being over here they very much perceive it as a very americanized um issue is how is ufology and the paranormal perceived from your side of the pond looking over uh, to us over in the uk when it comes to other countries, you're definitely correct. The people that are in ufology in the United States, they look at the cases in that country alone because there are quite a few and they are documented and there's a lot of witnesses. Now, when we're looking at other countries, have it be in the UK, you have the Penn Turk incident, you have the Rendlesham incident, or if we look at places like Brazil, like the Colares Brazil incident mm-hmm. or the Varginha incident as well, 
Um, because, and this is just merely my understanding, and please correct me if I am wrong, but it seems like from someone looking at it on this side of the pond, as you said, um, <laughs> and speaking to many other American ufologists, they want to focus on their country, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I do also believe that we need to look at the entire world. But of course, there's also that for other countries aside from the UK, there is that language barrier where you'll have reports written, but it's not written in a language that you know how to read or speak. So you're going yeah. to kind of avoid those because you just don't understand them. And that's understandable. In the same case with the UK, for instance, there's certain jargon, there are certain locations that the US or other countries just don't really know about. So they can't relate to it. They can't necessarily in the past, let's say before the internet, they had to get an atlas, they had to get a map and be like, okay, now where's London? Okay, what's been happening in London recently? And so it's been a lot more, it was difficult in the past, but it's gotten a lot easier. But it mm -hmm. seems that I think with the more people that I've spoken to, they're being more open-minded to looking at other countries. But it seems like the United States with their UFO sightings, they have their hands full. Sure. Well, you, you're a big place. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, and then, so uh, true. The, the Brits also have this way of, well, a lot of them have just had a giant stick up their backside. And if they don't understand it and they, they, they can't put a label on it properly, then it just doesn't exist. No. And it's easier to blame the Americans, you know, because that's what they, they do. We it's just perceived that everything UFO wise happens in America. They forget or ignore the likes of Rendlesham and all of the, you know, really high profile prominent cases that we have over here, you know, Scotland being a UFO hotspot up there. Um, but, but as you say, um, I, we've spoken about it quite a lot in, in the research that we do. Sometimes it's easier for people to mock something that they don't understand or don't want to understand through fear because it, yeah. it's easier to say oh it doesn't exist all of those americans making these stories up because they would have to question religious views you know the world as they know it and that's actually really scary for people it's scary enough for us who believe in it let alone people who are on that cusp of is it true isn't it true speaking of um, have you had any, just, you know, like high strangeness that happens with, with you when you're trying to broadcast or when you're trying to record or if you're trying to do any field work? Do you get a lot of that happening? One that I've had that's reoccurred more than once is when I've interviewed people um, in relation to Skinwalker Ranch. So I had the pleasure to speak with the superintendent, Thomas Winterton, and the- So jealous. Oh my gosh, he's amazing. He's such a nice guy. The entire team, they're fantastic. When I had spoken to Thomas, he was in, in his office on the ranch and we had so many tech issues that have never happened before. Um, I was like, Thomas, I'm so, so sorry. Like, I didn't mean this to happen. He says, Christina, you're not the first person. And I'm like, what? And he's like, tech issues happen all the time. And we have the strongest internet connection that you could ever imagine. But when it mm. comes to interviews, talking about the ranch on the ranch, it almost never goes well. No. Then I had spoken to retired Navajo Ranger John Dover. And when we spoke about Skinwalkers the and Skinwalker Ranch, the internet would go out on his side. His headphones weren't working. His, his audio wasn't working. The internet was just blacking out constantly and I was almost pulling out my hair and I'm like this is such an amazing conversation it is it is hard to get a hold of this man and now everything's going bad oh, just, I'm so upset with myself and when I had spoken to him he's like no this is normal when we talk about these two things yeah you're gonna have these really odd tech issues now I'm I don't really know how I feel about that, if I believe them or not. I'm open-minded to it, but I feel like there might have been just like a glitch on one of our sides. I'm not too sure because it's only happened with them, with other people. It hasn't necessarily been the case. When I spoke to Brandon Fugel, the owner of Skinwalker Ranch, he wasn't on the ranch, but he was in his office in, um, 
I want to say Salt Lake. I could be wrong. Yeah, but, that's right, Salt Lake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, there weren't any tech issues on that side, even when we spoke about the ranch um, in detail, actually. So I'm not really necessarily sure when it comes to just like odd tech issues with the paranormal, but it is something worth considering. And I think that we need to remain cautious, I guess, in a sense, and also always make sure to do runs before the show to make sure that everything goes smoothly because you never know what's going to happen so no. we were on early i was on earlier to make sure everything was working and the camera was working i still haven't got the light right and just right in the middle of it and it flickered screen's gone black that's it that's all i've got dang it's some high, this high strangeness is something that we experience virtually every time that that we we do stuff we're, we're kind of used to it now but that can be so frustrating. I, I'm, I'm sorry I to hear that. We, we, we just laugh about it now. <laughs> so, Christina, what do you think we could do as a group of females in this field to get more females involved in the field of paranormal and ufology? How can we promote what we do? One really good one and I think it's one that we've all been practicing now is just doing the shows that we're doing to be those voices to be that example as well because while there might be literally thousands of podcasts and let alone let alone knowing that there are thousands of podcasts related to the UFO phenomenon the reason to why so many of them are successful if not almost all of them is because people relate to that one specific host how they present the information or because it reminds it resembles the per, like one of the viewers right so mm-hmm. you're like oh my gosh nat this this she she reminds me of me or same with abigail she reminds me of me i need to watch that content so i think that when we put ourselves out there providing the content that amuses us that wants to inform us people can relate to that they can feel that as well to where they're like you know what I really like their content you know what they're actually inspiring me to get involved maybe I should start a show or write a book or do something so Mm -hmm. I think that putting ourselves out there is the absolute best thing that we can do yeah and sorry no go ahead Abigail um have you had any like backlash from other paranormal investigators or broadcasters and UFO broadcasters have you had any (laughs) not to my face not to my (laughs) face but there's a lot going in the background I can tell you that yeah yeah I've never seen anything negative about yourselves wow that's really good anyone that has anything um that's like really rude because look, I, I appreciate criticism. I do. I'm grateful for it because it's, it's helped me over the last two years. But if it's just like just flat out negative block, delete, yeah. block, 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 because I just don't have time for that because I've realized this in myself. I can get 10 really nice comments. Oh, Christina, I love your content. And I'll get that one comment. That's just terrible. It brings me down for like a good few minutes, sometimes a day, yeah. depending on the situation. And it was bothering me so much. I'm just like, block, blockity, block, block. I just, I don't have the mental capacity to harbor that. Mm. But I mean, behind the scenes, I've, I've heard a decent amount of pretty negative things. So I just, I, I, I don't want to be a part of that. I want to stay on the no. positive side of everything. We find sometimes the negativity that we hear about the things we do um, with primarily UFO identified often will come from females themselves. So the criticism about being um, male orientated comes from the females, which surprised us in a way, didn't it, Abs? Yeah, and and, and when we explain to them that actually our organisation is a 50-50 split of males and females, and we just we are just as involved as the males, mm-hmm. and we do this and we do that, and then she flipped it around to say, oh, well, you're facilitating the men. But we can't win. No. We can't win. No, so I'm, 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 I'm hoping that more shows like this and the more females that come forward, we should be boosting each other and building each other up, not tearing each other down. No, and unfortunately, that's a bit of a female trait sometimes in some women, isn't it? That jealousy 
comes through and and they will knock you down rather than promote you just just because and that's a sad state of affairs as you say because we should all be clubbing together and supporting each other and you want to think of walk a mile in your shoes and then then criticize yeah. yeah a podcasting isn't easy and people don't realize how much research and how much prep goes into it and they just assume that you just jump on camera you jump on the mic and you're like you're ready to go but there's so much work behind it and when it comes to this conversation that we're having now you're right it is rather disappointing that more people aren't supporting one another but the big reason is that for the majority of our mentality as as a human species we're more individualistic than communal we always want to one up somebody else versus doing it hand in hand where it, in in this field for instance you're always going to have a competition of who's going to drop the best the best hot news on on the topic versus having multiple people write an article together and drop the news together. Now, we, we do see that from time to time, do not get me wrong, but for the majority, that's not the case. Everyone wants to be first. And that goes back to our very primitive instincts of survival. Yeah. So that's, I don't think that's going to change really anytime soon, but all we can do is in, embrace that, for instance, but also to say that we're not a part of that mentality. We want everyone to succeed. We want to do this together because we're only going to find those answers when we get everyone's perspective. If it's just your perspective, good luck, baby. You're not going to get anything. You're not going to get those answers. So, Christina, how do you feel that um, the media play their part in influencing how ufos and paranormal and that kind of thing that we look into how it's influenced out there in the in the main for people do you think it's done positively negatively or very systematically i think before the preliminary report that was released in june of 2021 it was a little bit more biased in the sense where they kind of laughed at these stories now they did still report ufo sightings um, in the united states and i'm assuming in other countries as well yeah. where, like the news would kind of cover these things but they would laugh at it they would play um x files music in the background how like, a little clip art of a little flying saucer doing its thing and while i am grateful that they did cover these stories because even before 2021 people have always been interested in it have it be for merely entertainment or have it be because they're they truly believe it to be the case putting that aside it was still covered now after this report right before this report there was an extensive amount of coverage the media was like what's the report gonna say what's going on and they were really enthusiastic as soon as the report was released the news start, stopped covering it all together. Now, pr in present day, there are still a few reports of UFO sightings that when people call them in or when they give it to New Fork or MUFON. And from what I've realized, it's a lot less biased. They're not playing that silly music anymore, but they're taking it a little bit more seriously and they're not adding their commentary at the end of these stories that's not always the case of course you're still going to have some reporters that are going to scoff at this and i've seen it but for the most part it's doing a lot better than it did just a few years ago yeah and do you think the, the you know obviously we've talked about there's there's way more podcasts out there and there's a lot of us doing a lot of this important work do you think that helps influence the way the media thinks about UFOs and paranormal, you know, in addition to the likes of, you know, the big reports out there that come and go. That's hard to say, because I'm speaking from my generation alone. We don't watch the news. We don't really care for the news. Uh, <laughs> okay. They could literally say anything and we're like, yeah, I don't care. But when we're looking at podcasts, documentaries, articles, this thing, social media especially, that is something that they're more interested in, that they, that they care more about and where they get their news from, not the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. So do I care that they cover it? Yeah, of course. Of course I care. But people my age do not. These podcasts that we're doing right now, Nat and Abigail, 
this is so much more important, in my opinion, for my generation, because they take us a little bit more seriously than the mainstream. Yeah. Do you think the governments in our respective countries influence the, you know, the mainstream media, but also the likes of what we're doing in in podcasting and stuff like that? Do you think there's any sort of, I hate to use the word, sort of conspiracy or manipulation of truth or evidence from, from the governments in our countries? It's hard to say due to the fact that I'm just not knowledgeable in that field in particular. Mm -hmm. But if we look at, okay, here's a really good example. FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, right? It's getting the people to ask the government for information. The FOIA king is John Greenwald Jr. And when he asks for certain reports, he has to wait six years. 10 yeah. years, even longer than that, on some information that he might seem as just like, why are you hiding this information? And there's other reports that he does receive in a short period of time, others that he waits a long time for, but he still ends up getting them. Is Would that be classified as the government holding information? Yes, absolutely. But the reason to that, from my understanding, would be because we don't want our adversaries to get that information. Now that's in quotation marks because that is the excuse that is used. Now, sometimes that really is the case. Remember that all these countries, they're not friends. They're all out for themselves. Just mm-hmm. like how we had mentioned a little bit earlier. So I would expect something like this to happen where you're having certain information refrained from the public because it can be quote, too dangerous. Now I think in today's age, we are very capable of knowing this information. If the governments across the globe have been visited by extraterrestrials, if we are being visited and things like this, do we have reverse engineered technology, such as what Bob Lazar had claimed that we did? I think that we are very capable of having that information. But at the same time, if the government were to release that, one, they would no longer have hold of the narrative, but two, it would make them look really bad because they've been, you know, they've been doing disinformation and then they're like, oh, actually, yeah, yeah, we, we've been visited, right? It's going to make them look really terrible. The public's going to be like, you've been lying to us this whole time. Now, when it comes to my generation, we just don't really see it as necessarily important because from what we've heard from our parents and our grandparents, government uh, does a lot of disinformation. Mm -hmm. So it's not anything new. I think that disclosure is going to come from the people. Have it be a mass sighting, have it be shows that we're doing where we're talking about the facts, talking about the tangible evidence, or even the anecdotal accounts as well. Those are also just as important. I think that we are going to get it from the people, not from the government. I think it would be so much better if the government just went, look, our predecessors got it wrong, they lied, this is what it is. See, but showing weakness is probably the worst thing you could ever do uh, when, when it comes to people that, that hold a lot of power. See, we're getting, mm. we're getting little tiny wins. We got a little one this week where um, quite a big um, branch of the pre- police force here, quite a big region, um, actually put a Freedom of Information Act request that we had put in. They put it online for everybody to see, which is a big oh, thing over nice. here. It's huge yeah. over yeah. here. Because we've had some police forces say, um, we are not honouring this request. It's a frivolous waste of our time. Yeah. And we've had that said to us. And here's this other bigger police force saying, we've had this, have a look. And the whole world can have a look. It's there for you to see. So it's we were, we were kind of blown away by it, weren't we? Yeah, I was I was shocked. And then to find out it was ours. Like, whoa, another one. So, so just to give you a bit of background, Christina, on that, every year, um, ufoidentify.co.uk write to every single police force in the United Kingdom and put in freedom um, of information requests for any reports of any type of 
unexplained sightings, UFO phenomena, that kind of thing. And as Ab says, 99% come back with either we haven't had anything or we're not telling you for whatever reason they will put on that. You know, it's going to take us too long. It's going to cost us too much money or it's a waste of time us telling you. Um, so, yeah, we were really excited that, that one of those requests that we put in suddenly they were very open with. So it was a small little victory for us in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all about the small little victories, I think, with it. Exactly. It's, it's all those drops of water that fill up a bucket. It, mm-hmm. Everything counts. Every little step matters. So I think that's really exciting for you guys. Yeah. Just to touch on that, our friend Bob Lazar, who you talked about before, kind of a very controversial figure in the field. Love Love the guy. Uh, So so do I in (laughs) ufology. But he, he, whenever anyone talks about Bob Lazar in our field, it's a bit like um, either people love him or hate him. Kind of, there's not that middle ground really. What are your personal thoughts on Bob Lazar and the? work that he supposedly was hired to do do you think he's a genuine example of someone who has worked in ufology and is now being discredited for speaking out it's so hard to say because we don't really have all of that evidence that many of us want i'm i'm on the fence i'm neither pro him or against him i had Mm -hmm. i had to do two shows about him on my channel and it was like three hours long in total to the point where i even brought in richard dolan to hear his input as well along with jimmy church of fade to black radio because i'm like i'm still so new to the field and while I really want to understand everything, at the same time, I I also don't like bringing my opinions and my bias to my research because that affects mm-hmm. the way you do your research, right? So like, let's say you're pro um, Lazar, you're going to find information that only goes with what you believe. Or if you're against him, it's the same issue. Yeah. So when I do any of my research, how it be about anyone or anything, I try my absolute best to not have preconceived ideas, preconceived notions, but also to bring my my bias because with my shows and my research, as I had mentioned at the very beginning, I want to bring this to my generation. I also want them to make their own decisions. I'm not here to force feed anyone what no. I believe to make them believe for them to be a mini me. I, yeah. I don't I don't want more mini Christinas. Thank you very much. I want them to think for themselves. But when it comes to Bob Lazar, I truly am on the fence and I would love to know more. Of course, I would absolutely love to speak with him and oh, to yeah. ask him questions. Oh, yeah. That 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 would be an absolute, you know, a dream. But I think at this point in time, because I don't have the evidence, because I haven't spoken to him, I, I really can't say pro or against. But I did happen to see a new like trailer made by fans of a Bob Lazar film. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It just came out, I think, like a few days ago, maybe a week now. It was passed to me by um, a listener, and it was so well done by made just by fans. And I'm like, is this going to be a movie or not? Come on, guys. (laughs) They make a movie on this. It was so good. So I recommend go to YouTube, type in Bob Lazar trailer. Again, it was made by fans. It's not a movie coming out. So good. I think he's been – it doesn't matter whether you are – whether you believe him or not, he has done the job for the government, basically. If you believe him, then you're fueling their fire. If you don't believe him, so it's like they've put him out as misinformation. So Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what way you are or what you think or what the evidence comes out with. He will always... He will always cause this chasm between the two sides. Non-believers will never believe him. Believers. So he's kind of doing the government's job for them. Mm. It doesn't matter if he's proved right. It doesn't matter if he's proved a fake because they'll all still battle just the same. He'll always remain a controversial figure. No, absolutely. And he'll always create fights in the bar for sure with this kind of conversation. (laughs) So that's what makes this um topic so difficult especially when it comes to bob lazar's because you're you're right abigail you're you don't know which one 
is true first off no matter who you speak to they're gonna have their own opinions on it and they're yeah. gonna fight you and what's, yeah. it, what, and what's the light working with Jim, work, what was it like working with jimmy church because he, he again is another controversial figure Ah, uh, yeah i i he's such a great person he has been one of the very very few people in the field that took me seriously since the very beginning that has been nothing but respectful and kind to me if anything he's become my mentor really teaching me how to be better doing um podcasts i'm now on the radio kunx db and he's just kind of he's been my mentor in these aspects now what his beliefs are what his thoughts are his him being controversial i really don't care about that stuff if anything i i respect that friendship that we've gained because once again he's been one of the very few people that has been nothing but kind and and i and i appreciate that now i do have him he's my co-host now for mysteries with a history it's been like a whole year and a little bit and i'm so surprised but what's really interesting about that show in particular is that i bring in the research i bring in the notes and the and the books that i've read and then he brings in his years of experience of also looking into those topics as the story kind of unfolded so you are hearing two different aspects to the cases that we cover mine which is just bookworm going on over here and then he brings in his um his information as well so he i think he's he's really awesome in the sense of just being kind to people but also bringing in his experience more so than just reading books and then regurgitating yeah, he's, that. he's been at it for decades and he's <laughs> yeah all i mean i've yeah, he's spoken I've, to everyone. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I've, I've been up, well, because the show's on quite late here. Yeah. And I have set alarms to sort of get up at two o'clock in the morning to switch this on <laughs> to, to get it live because I don't want to go back and listen to it the next time because I'll have opinions and I'll want to get on Twitter. And <laughs> I've, I've set alarms for stuff like that. Is yeah, that he's, yeah, he's really good at opening those doors where like someone will give an answer and he's like, that's not good enough give me a better answer and I'll just keep poking and poking. And that's a skill in itself. It's not for everyone. It's not something that um, a lot of people do, but in his case, that's what makes him such a unique uh, host on his show, Fade to Black, is that he knows where to poke and where to get the most elaborate answers from mm -hmm. his guests. And uh, he's opened many windows in my browser. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, that looked that up. Well, so, looked that up. Chris Christina, just to finish off, what do you think the his the the future looks like for women in ufology? What what does the future hold for us uh, as women in this field? We are getting more women in this field, as we know. This is a fact. We also know that there's also more women being in the in the STEM field, looking mm -hmm. at science. We we can't be held down anymore. We got to keep going forward. So it, the future seems very bright for us and for everyone have it be children have it be adult have it be teenagers have it be men women any race any anything it's bright for every single one of us and i think that as we continue to create content we're only going to inspire more and more people yeah absolutely and long may it continue oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah so um, on behalf of Abs and I, thank you very, very much for your insight tonight on our on our show and for giving us your um, ideas, your, you know, thinkings behind everything. It's always good to hear a different perspective, especially from one from over the pond, from where and, we are. And um, positivity is a beauty. Yeah. And uh, we hope that you will join us again in the future. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Okay, if anybody else wants to put forward somebody for our an, for an interview from the ladies, <laughs> from the women of the dark, hit us up. Our website is www.ufoidentified.co.uk and you can catch up on the podcast from Pursuit of the Paranormal and Women of the Dark, um, where you usually get your podcasts. A big thank you. To Christina Gomez and, and and believe you can find her all over YouTube because it's so easy to get it. Thank you again. Thank you.